You do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it is all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith and hope. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. And in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbours worthy. Instead of hating the people you think are war makers, Hate the appetites and disorder in your own soul, which are the causes of war. If you love peace, then hate injustice, hate tyranny, hate greed. But hate these things in yourself, not in another. Love is not a matter of getting what you want. Quite the contrary. The insistence on always having what you want, on always being satisfied, on always being fulfilled, makes love impossible. The beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise we love only the reflection of ourselves we find in them. The rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form, of contemporary violence. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns 
to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything, is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activity neutralizes our work for peace. It destroys our own inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom which makes work fruitful. We are so obsessed with doing that we have no time and no imagination left for being. As a result, people are valued not for what they are, but for what they do or what they have, for their usefulness. People may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find, once they reach the top, that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. In a world of noise, confusion and conflict, it is necessary that there be places of silence, in a discipline and peace. In such places, love can blossom. The greatest need of our time is to clean out the enormous mass of mental and emotional rubbish that clutters our minds. Learn how to meditate on paper. Drawing and writing are forms of meditation. Learn how to contemplate works of art. Learn how to pray in the streets or in the country. Know how to meditate, not only when you have a book in your hand, but when you are waiting for a bus or riding a train. In silence, God ceases to be an object and becomes an experience. Let us come alive to the splendor that is all around us and see the beauty in ordinary things. For nothing has ever been said about God that hasn't already been said better by the wind in the pine trees.
do not look for rest in any pleasure because you were not created for pleasure. You were created for joy. And if you do not know the difference between pleasure and joy, you have not yet begun to live. Before we can realize who we really are, we must become conscious of the fact that the person we think we are, here and now, is at best an imposter and a stranger. What can we gain by sailing to the moon if we cannot cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? The more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer, because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. The one who does most to avoid suffering is in the end, the one who suffers most. Only the person who has had to face despair is really convinced that they need mercy. Those who do not want mercy never seek it. It is better to find God on the threshold of despair than to risk our lives in a complacency that has never felt the need of forgiveness. A life that is without problems may literally be more hopeless than one that always verges on despair. Perfect hope is achieved on the brink of despair when instead of falling over the edge we find ourselves walking on air. Self-conquest is really self-surrender. Yet before we can surrender ourselves, we must become ourselves. For no one can give up what they do not possess. Paradoxically, I have found peace because I have always been dissatisfied. My moments of depression and despair turn out to be renewals, new beginnings. If I were once to settle down and be satisfied with the surface of life, with its divisions and its cliches, it would be time to call in the undertaker. So then, this dissatisfaction, which sometimes used to worry me, and has certainly, I know, worried others, has helped me, in fact, to move freely and even gaily with the stream of life.
finally I am coming to the conclusion that my highest ambition is to be what I already am. The spiritual life is first of all a life. It is not merely something to be known and studied. It is to be lived. In humility is the greatest freedom. As long as you have to defend the imaginary self that you think is important, you lose your peace of heart. As soon as you compare that shadow with the shadows of other people, you lose all joy because you have begun to trade in unrealities. And there is no joy in things that do not exist. There is in all visible things an invisible fecundity, a dimmed light, a mere namelessness, a hidden wholeness. This mysterious unity and integrity is wisdom the mother of us all. There is in all things an inexhaustible sweetness and purity, a silence that is a fountain of action and joy. It rises up in wordless gentleness and flows out to me from the unseen roots of all created being. When we are alone on a starlit night, when by chance we see the migrating birds in autumn descending on a grove of junipers to rest and eat, when we see children in a moment when they are really children, when we know love in our own hearts, or when like the Japanese poet Basho, we hear an old frog land in a quiet pond with a solitary splash. At such times, the awakening, the turning inside out of all values, the newness, the emptiness and the purity of vision that make themselves evident. All these provide a glimpse of the cosmic dance.
To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything that is given us. And that has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of God's love. Every moment of existence is a grace. For it brings with it immense graces. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening to new wonder and to the praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. And that is what makes all the difference. At the center of our being, is a point of nothingness which is untouched by illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes of our life which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. To say that I am made in the image of God is to say that love is the reason for my existence. For God is love. Love is my true identity. Selflessness is my true self. Love is my true character. Love is my name. The whole idea of compassion is based on a keen awareness of the interdependence of all these living beings, which are all part of one another and are all involved in one another. We are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time. God manifests everywhere, in everything, in people and in things and in nature and in events. The only thing is, 
we don't see it. I have no program for this seeing. It is only given. But the gate of heaven is everywhere. <laughs> 